Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Smekla. I'm from the Department of Educational Technology, the School District of Palm Beach County. I'm really um, excited today to uh, have you all here. We are with um, the South FAU's Ascend Brain Institute. Um, they are joining us today to talk about their exhibit and all kinds of really, really fun stuff. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box over here. And we're gonna go ahead and get started with Dr. Nicole and Chris. Welcome, Chris and Nicole. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. We're so excited to be here. So are we, so on with the show. All right, so welcome. We are here in the brain exhibit at the Science Center. So we're gonna talk all about the brain today. I'm gonna to do some cool experiments for you to see at home. You're also gonna to get to try one of these experiments at home. So we highly encourage you to try it. If you haven't already, go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a pen, pencil, marker, whatever you have laying around. This is gonna be for our experiment later on. Just make sure you get that ready now. What we're going to do first, we're going to take a virtual tour of our brain exhibit. So we're going to see the space all around me and what we have going on here at the Science Center. So we've preloaded a video for you guys to watch, and we're going to go ahead and take that tour now. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm an educator here at the South Florida Science Center. And since we're temporarily closed, we thought we'd bring you some virtual exhibit tours. Today, we're touring our human brain exhibit. As you enter the exhibit, you're greeted by dual virtual brain displays, alongside a preserved specimen of a real nervous system. Just around the corner, you'll get a chance to build a network of neurons. If building your own network wasn't enough, you can take a deep dive into the brain all the way down to the molecular level. Are real brain scans your thing? We've got those too. Scan our fun here to see what's inside. It's not just human brains we have here either. You can test your reaction time or help send a message by firing neurons. Get to know your senses as you feel, smell, and hear your way through the exhibit. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if a robot could read your brain waves? Before you leave, spend some time learning how your brain developed to enjoy this exhibit today. Before we head back out to our Hall of Discovery, take another deep dive with our amazing microscopy lab. All right, I hope everybody enjoyed that virtual tour of our brain exhibit. Please stay tuned to all of our social media channels for up-to-date information on the coronavirus pandemic. We'll also be bringing you more virtual science tours and of course, live virtual science lessons. Our hearts go out to everybody affected by this coronavirus pandemic. And while you're out there, please make sure to stay smart, stay safe and use your brain. Hey everybody, Christian here. I want to just thank you for watching our content. If you enjoyed, please make sure you hit that like button down below. Also, as you guys know, we are going through some very tough times and our hearts at the Science Center goes out to everyone that's been affected by this coronavirus outbreak. And as most of you also know, we are a nonprofit organization. We rely very heavily on live programs as well as admissions in order to keep the Science Center lights on. So because we're not open, we do need your help. If you enjoyed our content, please consider hitting that donate button down below and giving anything you can, $1, $5, any amount will help us continue our mission to open every mind to science. All right.
right, I hope everybody enjoyed that little virtual tour of the Science Center. So while I do work here, I don't know everything about the brain, and I still have some questions. So hopefully, along with you, I'm gonna learn a couple more things about the brain today. So Dr. Nicole, we saw that really cool brain that's really, really colorful. It's a huge model of it. Now, is it true that we only use part of our brain? That's a great question, Chris. Actually, that is one thing that neuroscientists have been trying to debunk for a long time. And we have, we know that you use way more than 10% of your brain. You actually use 100% of your brain, but you just don't use it all at the same time. So example, for an example, try reading a book and riding a bike at the same time. Or I guess riding a bike and sleeping at the same time. Those require different, the use of different parts of your brain. So that's why you use it all, just not simultaneously. Very cool. What about that touch table that I was using? So I was building neurons. What if I broke those neurons? Are they broken forever? That's a really good question. And even when I was in school, they told me if you lose a neuron, you lose it forever. But we now know that that's not true. The brain has a remarkable capability of healing itself through something called neuroplasticity. So your brain changes all through your life from the day you're born until the day you die, which is why you can learn new things and why you can remember people when you first meet them. So yes, the, your brain does change throughout the lifetime. That's awesome, that's good to know. My brain is still growing and I'm still learning new things, so thank you for that. Absolutely. What about things like crossword puzzles? Do those really help with making my brain any stronger than it is? That's another great question, Chris. Um, the crossword puzzle myth is a myth. Um, crossword puzzles will help the neurons that connect your brain regions that are involved in using or creating crossword puzzles or solving them, I should say. Um, however, the best way to keep your entire brain healthy is through physical exercise. That enriches your brain with oxygen and allows something called BDNF brain-derived neurotrophic factor to uh, kind of fertilize all of your neurons together. So your entire brain becomes younger and healthier through physical exercise and not just one pathway. Very cool. So we can keep our bodies healthy and our mind healthy at the same time. That is awesome. Absolutely. All right. And I have one last question. So I have these awesome microscopes right here. Now, while this is really cool here at the Science Center, we can take a look at different things on microscopes. We're not quite using them for research. We're not using them to their fullest potential. What do you use these microscopes for in your lab? We use them for imaging different brain regions. We can use fluorescent dyes and fluorescent probes in order to look at tiny little neurons and other small molecules and structures in the brain. So right here we can actually see some of the neurons that actually came from your lab, correct? Correct. We can see some images here and then over here we can see some smaller brains. So if I zoom in on those, we can actually see a full slice of a brain there. Do you have any more pictures of these that you'd be able to share with us? I'd be happy to, Chris. And what you're looking at right there on your right hand side, that one, yes, that is um, a picture of a mouse brain. And I'm just going to show you a couple more images more closely. Here we go. So a sci neuroscientists can't use human brains to look at neurons, but we can use other model organisms like the mouse. And here is a picture of, or a depiction of the mouse brain. And you'll notice here that it is actually, looks quite different than a human brain. However, the neurons and the structures in the brain are similar to humans. And here's another depiction of it. So what I'm gonna show you next, and Chris, what you are looking at there on your screen that you just showed. So if you imagine that we're gonna take a camera and zoom in, we're gonna go right across this plane here. We zoom in and have this part facing towards us. And this is what you have on your screen, Chris. 
So now I'm going to show you a couple other ways that we can see neurons. Here is that, that brain slice. And what this is, this is showing an image of the mouse motor thalamus. So if you imagine hitting or planning to hit a baseball before it comes to you and you hit the ball, this region in the thalamus, actually here, here in magenta, connects to the motor cortex here. And they go back and forth, they communicate between neurons in these two brain regions in order for you to be able to plan hitting the ball and then execute that process. So next, I wanna zoom in on this part here. So we're gonna do a deep dive into this region of the brain that's called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is involved, very involved in learning and memory. I also want to point out here that all of these images that I'm showing you are taken by researchers right here in South Florida from FAU, Scripps, and Mox Planck, Florida. So we thank them for, for their contribution to this. Um, so here we're zoomed into the hippocampus and you can see different types of cells in blue here. And also here's a neuron in green and an interneuron in red. So now what I'd like to go is even deeper and show you how we can see an actual neuron. This is one neuron. So you can see the different parts of the neuron, the nucleus and its extensions and other small parts of it. And I'm gonna share with you a fun fact. We have about 90 billion neurons in your head. That's a lot of neurons that we have. So now I just wanna show you one more image. And this one, we, I'm gonna look at how the neurons from the brain connect to the eyeball. So we'll focus here and zoom in again, a deep dive. And this is from the retina. This is how you can see these receptors here in green are photoreceptors that sense light from the outside in your eyeball. And that connects to the red neurons that send that information to your brain. So neuroscientists really have great new technologies in order for us to really observe all these neurons at a microscopic level. Wow. And I'm going to hop in, guys. I'm going to hop in, guys, real quick. We've got a whole bunch of questions coming already. Um, so I just want to ask just a few of them. Um, they're just so quick in the chat. These kids are asking a ton of questions. Um, but the, the first question was, on your slides, they were wondering why all this stuff was glowing. Does it really look like that in our bodies? It does not look like that in our bodies. We can use fluorescent labels that are specific to neurons or specific to receptors that allow us to uh, specifically target those structures. And that's why we can see them using these labels. Awesome. And uh, you did answer Dylan's question, which is how many nerves or neurons are in your brain, uh, which you said, was it 90 million, 90 billion? I can't 90 remember. 90 billion. 90 billion, that's a big number, right? Um, also, Dr. Nicole, they were curious what kind of scientist you were. I am a molecular neuroscientist. So and maybe explain what that means in, in child sure. language. <laughs> sure, so I study those neurons that you saw images of. I do, I do some imaging, but I primarily look at how those, neuron fun, no, those neurons function. And I'm focused on a specific neurotransmitter called serotonin that some of you may have heard of before. Um, it's the happy chemical. But I look at how serotonin, its changes in the levels of serotonin can affect your mood and your behavior. And um, uh, also, you mentioned, I think Chris maybe mentioned that exercises are good for helping our brain. Um, do you guys want to share the question on how, what exercises are best from Betty? Uh, what exercises are best from the brain to help us keep our brain going? Sure, Betty, any kind of exercise is fantastic. Um, especially exercises that will increase your heart rate, which will improve blood flow to your brain and allow that oxygen rich blood to get in there. There you go. Yeah, there you go, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> that works awesome. too. <laughs> um, and uh, the other one is, is it possible to lose brain cells? That's one, and then I have one more after that. Is it possible to lose brain cells? It is possible for your brain cells to get to shrink and also to grow. 
So if you shrink a brain cell, that's, that doesn't mean it stays that way. There are many things that you can do throughout with lifestyle and things like exercise that will help your neurons grow, especially in regions like the hippocampus that allows you to form memories and to continue to learn throughout your life. Awesome. And um, so the questions were first, they wanted to know if we were going to get to see a real live brain um, here <laughs> on the screen. And I tried to explain that really the only way to see a live brain is to go through surgery and open up our, our, our heads. Right. Um, but how do we know so much about the brain? Like, can we study it while it's still living? I, I explained in the chat a little bit too about how we do dissect brains after, after people pass, that'll donate them. But like, how do we look at the brain right now that it's actually being used? How do we know about that? That's a very good question. And this is why we use model organisms. We can look at brain structures that are very similar to those that we have in humans. Obviously, we do not want to do experiments on a living human brain. No. <laughs> <laughs> the help of our animal models, worms, we even use fruit flies that have their own nervous system. We could talk about that at another time. And mice, that where we can look at how the cells function, um, how they function, yeah, and also how they're structured. We also have cell lines that we can produce that have living neurons in a Petri dish. Awesome. So that's how we can study that. Awesome, okay, well, we'll let you guys continue the presentation and we'll, we'll hop in in a little bit for some more questions. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole, for answering Thanks. those questions. A couple of them, most of them were over my head, so I really appreciate you being here to be able to answer those. That's awesome. So we're gonna go ahead and get ready to do a couple experiments. So I'm gonna show some slides here for you to be able to see what I'm talking about. So this class that we normally do is called Brain in Action. So we talk all about the brain. If you know what part, what body system our body, our brain is part of, go ahead and drop that in the link below. You might be able to see it there, but do it before you read it. All right, if you said the nervous system, you would be correct. So as Dr. Nicole mentioned, our body, our brain is made up of neurons, and those are nerve cells. We can see here on the screen, we have our nervous system, which is the brain, the spinal cord, and nerves. So we can see that little image of the brain there, and our brain can actually be broken and subdivided into different parts of the brain that we call lobes. So it might be a little bit difficult for you to see there, but I do have a brain puzzle here in front of me. And on that, in that brain puzzle, it's made up of those different lobes. So looking at what we see here. So again, these are the neurons, and you can see it in this model that I have on the screen versus this one here we can see they look pretty similar. So our neurons, not all of them are going to look exactly the same, but if you see this slide here with the neurons, that is the anatomy of the neuron. Now you can see the nucleus over on the left-hand side and all along the axon, there's something called myelin, myelin sheath, and this is where the messages are sent through. So those messages travel through there. So our brain can be subdivided into, again, different lobes. So the lobes of our brain, we have our frontal lobe, which we can see right here, and that's gonna be in the front of your head, hence the name frontal lobe. We've got our parietal lobe, which is gonna be higher and towards the middle of your head. We've got our temporal lobes, which are gonna be next to your temples. So that's gonna be this one here. And I'm gonna run out of hands in just a moment to be able to put all this together. So hopefully you can see it on the table there. We've got our occipital lobe, which is at the back of the head here. And then we've got our cerebellum. This little guy here goes down at the bottom and our brainstem. So the brainstem is really, really important for us. It 
provides all of the vital functions for our body. So things that are involuntary, things that we don't have to think about doing, such as breathing, blinking, sleeping, hunger, when we're actually hungry and not just eating because we're bored like I do sometimes. So that all comes from our brain stem. All right, so we're gonna move to our next slide here. So we can see, and I'm not sure if everybody was able to see the neuron slide here. So again, the neurons, this is what makes up our brain. And about 90 billion of them, we learned, make up our brain. And that's not including the neurons that are traveling through our body. Is that correct, Dr. Nicole? Yes, that's correct, Chris. Okay, so that's 90 billion just in our brain? That's right. That is awesome. So it is a really densely packed area. So imagine trying to fit 90 billion of anything inside of a container this small. So that's just an amazing feat that we're able to think with all of those connections. So again, the nucleus that we see there over on the left-hand side of the screen, so that's gonna be able to receive those signals, and then it's gonna send those signals down through that axon, out the axon terminal to either other nerve cells, to our brain, to muscles. So there are two main divisions that we can have for our neurons. We can have motor and sensory. So motor neurons are going to be sending signals away from our brain and then sensory neurons towards our brain. Now, of course, not all neurons are going to look like that perfect model there, just like not all cells are going to look exactly like the cell models that we look at, but this is a good idea of what they do look like. So we are going to test our brain here. So again, using, we're going to pass through these here, using our Strip test. So the, the strip test is basically going to show you a bunch of words on the screen. And what you're going to do as fast as you can, just read them aloud. So read all the way through. So it's going to be a couple of different colors on there. So you're just going to read what the word says there. And on the count of three, we're going to move to that and just read them aloud. See if you can count. See if you can time how fast you do it, because we're going to do it again a second time, and it's going to be a little bit different. So here we go with the Schroot test. So on the count of three, one, two, three, red, blue, orange, purple, orange, blue, green, red, blue, purple, green, red, orange, blue, red, green, purple, orange, red, blue, green, red, blue, purple. All right. So were you able to make it through now? All right, that was pretty easy, right? <laughs> we were able to read those. Did you follow along, Dr. Nicole? I did, but I got some of the words wrong. Like blue, I called purple, because it was in the color purple. <laughs> okay, yes. so that's what we're gonna do next. What we're gonna do next, so that one was a little bit easier, right? So we're gonna try something different this time. Instead of saying the word that we see there, we're actually gonna say the color that we see there. All right, is everybody ready? So on the count of three, one, two, three. So red, blue, orange, purple, orange, blue, green, red, green, red, purple, blue, blue, red, green, orange, red, orange. Oh, that one's green. Orange, purple, orange, blue, purple, green. Hmm. That one was a little more difficult, right? Yeah. So I know usually when I see text, I'm used to just reading the words. I'm not used to saying the colors that the text is written in. So our brain gets a little mixed up because those memories are stored in different places. And as we're trying to recall them, our brain is so used to recalling those proper words that we see there that we get mixed up and we say the actual word that we see there. Now, for somebody younger, this would 
that's just learning how to read, it might be easier for them to do the second test where they're just saying the colors because that's probably what they're going to learn first. All right, so what we're gonna get ready to do now, we're gonna test my muscles. So I'm gonna slide this out of here and I'm gonna pull out something called a spiker box. So a spiker box, what it does, it connects through these little tabs that will go on my arm here. So I'm gonna pull my sleeve up and it's going to read muscle activity. Now, if you remember a couple minutes ago, I said we have two different types of neurons. We have sensory neurons, which send brain, which send messages to our brain, and then we have motor neurons, which send messages away from our brain. So in the chat down below, tell me which type of neuron I'm going to be using here as soon as you see what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put these little tabs on me, these little electrodes, and I'm going to plug it into here. And what this is going to do is it's going to read the signals that my brain is sending to my muscles. So it's going to read that activity that is going on there. Now, you can see it on the iPad. There's a green line. So that tells us that there's not any activity being read right now. As soon as I turn on our little spiker box over here, we can actually hear sort of a humming sound and we can see there's a little bit of background activity. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to lift a couple things for you to be able to see that activity. So this is connected to my left arm. If I lift something like my water bottle here, that's not very heavy. You can see there is a little bit of activity. And I'll try to zoom in a little more for you there. We can see there is a little bit of activity that occurs. What if I lift something like a bowling ball? Go ahead and write in the chat what you think would happen. Are you gonna see more signals with the bowling ball or less signals when I lift the bowling ball? All right, are we ready? Here we go. Wow. So you can see it's going off the charts there. So lots and lots of activity, lifting the bowling ball. And we can also activate those muscles without lifting anything at all. If I just squeeze my hand here, you can see I'm producing lots and lots of activity because those muscles, again, are activated by my brain, and being read by these electrodes here. So our spiker box is kind of the brains of the operation which sends the signal to the iPad, then it's decoded into something for us to see here. All right, so that is really cool. In our video though, I asked, have you ever wondered if a robot could read your brain waves? So we're reading the waves here, but what if we can turn those waves, turn that reading into action? Well, I have just the thing. So we have something here that plays nicely with our spike box, and it is called a claw. So we can see our claw here, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get myself plugged into it. Now, we do use this pretty often, and one of the questions that we get when we allow people to use it is, is it going to shock me? Are those electrodes going to hurt me? So these electrodes are similar to our sensory neurons. So they're just picking up the signal over here and sending it to the computer. All right, so I'm going to try to get it so you can see there. Okay, so again, you can see if I am squeezing my hand, you can see there's activity on there. So what we're going to do, we're going to get our claw on here. So I've got to get it plugged in. We're just going to flip that around there. Okay. And as I 
as I move my arm, the claw should be opening. That's why we call it experimenting, because it doesn't always go right as planned. So I did test this out beforehand, and it was working for me. And let's see if we can get it to go now. Okay, one last ditch effort is going to be to change the batteries. If not, I do apologize. Okay, there we go. So changing the batteries, that seemed to work. So as I close my hand, you can see, if I lift this here, all right, so as I close my hand and squeeze, you can see there is movement in the claw. So this can be used for prosthetic arms. So scientists and researchers have been testing this for quite some time now, and they can actually use more complicated setups. So this is a very simple setup. So again, we're just using a couple of electrodes, just two leads here and then one ground, and that's able to get at least one servo moving for us to be able to activate this. So imagine if we had dozens of connections, then you would be able to move individual fingers, individual joints, and all of that. So while that is or will be a possibility in the future and is in some capacity now, there's still a lot to learn about the brain. So I'm going to unplug this here, and we're going to get ready for our actual experiment. Okay, so what we're going to be drawing is something that looks similar to this, and maybe I'll hold this a little closer, so it might be difficult for you to for you to see. So this one is really big and it's just a demonstration for you to be able to see exactly what we're going to do. So you can see there is a plus sign on one side and then there is a circle that is filled in on the other side. So you're just going to get a piece of paper or a an index card. So I just took my paper like this and I folded it in half one time. So hot dog style and then hamburger style, fold it in half one more time, and then fold it in half one more time. So it's a little bigger than a credit card or a wallet, and this is gonna be the perfect size for us. And what we're gonna use this as is our blind spot detector. So if you look at the slide that I have here, we can see that our brain is connected to our eye, through something called the optic nerve. So the optic nerve connects to our, connects our eye to our brain, and there's a blind spot there where it is connected. So we're gonna go ahead and find where we have that blind spot in our eye. So again, you have your card here, and what you're gonna do, you're gonna draw on one side a plus sign. So I'll draw my little plus sign here. Make it about the size of a penny. That's fine. So you can see the plus sign there. And then take your hand, put four fingers, and my hand's pretty big, so you can see it takes up about the whole page, but just put your four fingers. Then you're gonna draw a dot on that side at the same level with the plus sign, and you're gonna make it a little bigger. All right, so this one's a little smaller than a penny. And again, hopefully you can see that there with the plus sign on one side and then the dot on the other side. So you're gonna be looking at this. So you're gonna get really close to your face. Close one eye. So I'm closing my left eye and I'm going to put the plus sign in front of my eye here. So I'm closing my left eye but putting the plus sign in front of my left eye. And then the dot is going to go directly in front of my right eye. So again, left eye close, plus sign in front of it, right eye open, dot in front. Now, although the dot is directly in front of your right eye, we don't want to look at the dot. We actually want to look at the plus sign. So I'll turn around so you can kind of see it. So you can see it's lined up here. So right side dot left side plus sign, and we're gonna hold it really close and look over at the plus sign. 
And as you pull it away from you, and mine happens right about here. So this is about a foot away from me, I think. And that duck just disappears. I don't see it anymore. Me too. But I still see the white paper. Is it working for you, Dr. Nicole? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> it's so strange. So our brain is really, really powerful, right? And it just makes up that image in between there. So it takes, because there's white paper around it, it just kind of fills in that spot. It fills in that blind spot with just white. So this works. There's all sorts of different images that you can find for this to work with, but this is the simplest way for you to make one at home. Super simple, and it's a really cool trick to show other people. All right, so with our blind spot in one in each eye, you can try it with your other eye as well, and it should work. So with our blind spots, one in each eye, our brain actually takes those two images and it overlaps them together. And that's what allows us to see a full image there. All right, so Dr. Nicole, I think you have one more thing to share with us. So I'm curious to know, we had a virtual tour here of our lab. Would you be able to share a tour of your lab? Yes, we have a video from Dr. Lorena Ariel, and I believe we have that all set up for her video to go to take you into, into the lab and show her my microscopy. Awesome. Hi guys, how's it going? Well, unfortunately, we can't come to the Edna Runner Center. Right now, we all need to stay safe and practice social distancing, but we all miss you. So the team here spot decided to share with you a little bit about what we do in the lab. And as you know, we study the brain. So how do we do that? How do we study the brain? For example, the neurons. Remember when we talked about the neurons? And uh, we said they are very, very, very small, right? So how do we see them? How do we know what they look like? Like, how do we know about the dendrites and axons and the soma? Well, I'm gonna share with you one example of how we do that. Okay, so how do we see the neurons? Well, we need to use an equipment called a microscope, such as this one. So on a microscope, we have different lenses, like this one here, that are just gonna turn a very, very, very small thing into something really big, uh, big enough that it can be seen through the microscope if we put our eyes here or in the computer, okay? And then we can see how the neurons look like. So this is an example of a real neuron. And well, you guys remember, we have the soma here, the dendrites, and then the axon that's gonna continue here. It's not, um, we can, couldn't get the full axon in this picture because it's really long. Sometimes it can be very long. Um, so this is how we know what a neuron look like. And we can see them making connections, the connections that are so important for us to think, to feel, to move our bodies and everything that we already talked about. So just wanted to share with you guys a little bit of things that we do in the lab. I hope you stay well and we'll see you soon. Bye bye. Thanks to Dr. Ariel. And I just want to um, tell everybody watching too that we have several outreach and educational programs at the FAU Brain Institute. Um, they're after school programs targeted for middle school students and also late grade school. So if you're interested, please check out our website. It's called the Ascend Program. Very cool. That was an awesome tour of the lab. We got to see a real working microscope in the hands of a researcher. That is so cool. I want to thank you so much for joining me. I really had a fun time today. This was so cool to learn a little bit more about the brain along with everyone else here. It just shows that you should never stop learning. For sure. Thank you, Chris.
um, I have a couple more questions for you before Rebecca comes in to end, uh, end some of the other things that we're going to share later. Um, but one was, you were talking about neurons earlier, and Zoe asks, um, how do all the neurons perceive pain? And is that different for animals, like the mouse? And can we see that, uh, how, what pain looks like in a neuron? That's a very good question. And pain is actually sensed by something called a nociceptor. So those particular receptors send signals to the brain, which interprets that as pain. And yes, animals also have nociceptors. Awesome. Is it the same as ours or are they different or do we know yeah. that? Yeah, they are similar. They are the same as ours. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Um, Nicole asked um, if we can see all this during surgery, then why can't we investigate them during surgery instead of using animals? Obviously, some people don't like people, you know, harming animals or using animals for testing. Uh, but there's also a lot of rules out there, right, for uh, humans uh, especially. So do you want to talk just a little bit to, you know, some of our students about why we use animals instead of humans? Yeah, animals are a very important resource for us. And although we can learn a lot about the human brain when we are doing surgeries, we don't want to do unnecessary surgeries. Also, for example, the images that you see of the anatomy of the brain and all of the images of the neurons and other cells in the brain, we cannot do that in humans because it requires us to use a fluorescent dye. We do not want to inject that into a human brain. Yeah, for sure. There, there's also ethical issues. Though, you know, there's a lot, depending on what grade levels in the chat, you know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why we're not going to do these things to humans. Um, especially. And if you end up going in the medical field, that's a big part of going through your, your schooling is learning about experimentation and what, what's okay and what's not okay. Right. And I also think it is very important to note, I used to sit on something called the IACUC. And every university and accredited institution has an IACUC. It's the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. So there are extremely strict guidelines on how animals need to be treated and the proper use of care and mm -hmm. anesthetic and pain relief if there is any involved whatsoever. We also make sure that there isn't another out, uh, model that we computerized or cell model that we can use outside of animals. So all precautions and steps are taken to minimize the use of animals mm -hmm. and also to minimize any pain. Good to know, thank you. Uh, one last from Nicole. Nicole asked a lot of great questions. Um, but also, so when people are in an accident and have brain damage, um, is the brain able to heal from that? Or, or you know, like we heal if we get a cut or a scratch or something, our body heals that. Is that similar if the, our brain experiences something like that? Nicole, that's a great question. Yes, in many circumstances, the brain can heal. The, because of the fact that the brain is what we call plastic, not literally like a plastic water bottle, but it's, it's malleable. So your brain can change. Your brain is very adaptable and dynamic. So if you have, just like you're, when you're, you get a cut on your skin, your skin heals. Same thing with your brain, it can heal. And there's a great story about a woman who had a massive stroke in one side of her brain. She lost her ability to speak for almost eight years and to comprehend language. However, now she's a motivational speaker and has written wow. a best-selling book. So that's a great example of how well the brain can adjust and heal itself. Yeah, so it is possible. That's why it's important to do those exercises to keep it healthy when you're young, especially. So Absolutely. awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Chris and Nicole and Rebecca for all joining us and sharing with us. Um, Rebecca, do you just want to share uh, just some closing thoughts along with uh, ways that our students can uh, can talk back with us? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nicole. I learned so much. I feel like my brain's going to explode, but now I know that it won't because of your great presentation. Um, so for our students, we have an opportunity for you to share your thoughts on Nicole and Chris's presentation. Um, you can scan this QR code or you can go to the bit.ly, um, which we will place uh, right up here on the screen and share your thoughts. Let Chris and Nicole know, you know, what did you think of this presentation? What did you learn about the brain? What other questions do you still have? 
um, just share what uh, any reactions that you had, and they would love to hear that. Okay. And for my teachers out there, we have some additional resources for you. We have the Science Center's um, virtual learning page. We have the FAU Brain Institute website along with their virtual resources. We also have a really great Newzella article um, on how curiosity prepares the brain for learning. So some other ways to extend this session with your students, some great resources out there for you. And next up tomorrow, we have two sessions, um, really uh, for our secondary students, for our middle school and our high school students. Um, our 1130 panel is a medical panel, and we have a doctor uh, coming to talk to us all the way from Italy, as well as a doctor here in Palm Beach County. And then at 2.30, we have um, Zipline, which is a company that uses drones to deliver medical supplies in Africa. So both of these sessions are going to be highly interesting, and I hope you'll join us tomorrow. Once again, I'd like to thank uh, Chris and Nicole. Um, I'll let you guys say your uh, final thoughts, and we'll say goodbye. Yeah, once again, thank you everybody for joining us today. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to help open your mind to science. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the experiments that we do here, you can visit our website, SFSCA. So it's our initials, SFSCA.org. And you can check out our virtual science page there. We also have lots of stay at home STEM activities, thanks to Primetime, Long Beach County, for funding that. And once again, thank you, Dr. Nicole and the school official, for joining us and for having us here today. Great. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to the South Florida Science Center for having me jump in and tag along with you today. It's been really fun. Thanks to Palm Beach County School District as well for having us here. This has been really fun. And also for anyone who's interested in our after school programs, check out our website. We also have a summer mini camp at STEM Studio in Abaco. So check us out and thanks everyone for watching. All right. Those are some great opportunities for our students. Thank you so much for being here with us today.